Hey everybody, this is Jason Ostrowski and welcome to another episode of the Everything Real Estate Podcast. Joining us today on the podcast is Center Valley's very own Rebecca Francis. She is the team leader of the powerhouse Rebecca Francis team at Fox and Roach, and she is a true force in the luxury real estate market, earning our Chairman's Circle Diamond Award with her team consistently within the top half of 1% in sales within the BHHS network. Today, Rebecca and I are going to be discussing upping your price point. Upping your price point can make all the difference for you and your business when it comes to your income, saving you time, or allowing you to break into an entirely new market. We're going to lean into Rebecca's marketing background and high-end real estate experience to discuss how to best up your price point and touch upon what it takes to ultimately be a premier high-end agent. So let's discuss upping your price point with Rebecca Francis, and we'll pick it up on the other side. With me today is one of my favorite humans in real estate. Her name is Rebecca Francis, team leader of the amazing Rebecca Francis team in our Center Valley office. Rebecca, thank you so much for taking some time off from seemingly listing every luxury property in the Lehigh Valley to join us for a little while today. It's good to have you back on the podcast, by the way. So how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, it's been a while since we've yes. been together, even though I did see you yesterday, just true, for true, closure, true. we did have a chance to chat yesterday. Um, so today, you and I are going to talk about the importance of upping your price point. And I think that it's something that, in my opinion, does not necessarily get focused on enough in real estate, um, but it can lead to so many positive changes to your business. And we're going to touch upon some of those changes in this episode. But first, I want to start off by asking you, do you, Rebecca Francis, start each year with a business plan that includes an average sale price that you wish to achieve, number one? And if so, how do you formulate that number? Wow, that's a great question. Um, To be clear, I always start off every year with a business plan. And um, I have um, I have my my goal numbers. I've got stretch numbers, and um, and I go into that knowing what my current uh, average uh, list price and my current average sale price is. Do I focus on where I want to go? No, in terms of dollar or or um, sale price, probably not. But. Um, I, I do have a really good sense of where I stand in our current market. And um, like right now, we're at about average, uh, average sale price is around a million. And um, which is uh, the Lehigh Valley is not Philly, right? We we're, we have a lower price point, certainly. And um, so I, I kind of do a big majority of that that space around a million and my team does. So I, I'm pretty much where I want to be in terms of, of that number because um, there are some that are higher, but they they um, take a little bit longer to sell and I'll get them eventually. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? You bring up a really good point. And that's another thing I want to get into as we get uh, into this episode a little bit later is some of that luxury market and what it means to be a luxury agent, because it's not all it's cracked up to be at times. And so I, I do want to tell you know the, the agents listening that the way that I typically do it with my business plan is that if I kind of guesstimate where we are in the market and historically based on the units that I'm selling. So for an example, let's just say that this year was a tougher year. So my goal unit, say, was 30 units this year. Yeah. So then I know heading into next year with the interest rates kind of, you know, dipping down a little bit, uh, hopefully that's going to bring out more buyers and sellers. So I'm going to try and up my unit goal for next year to 40 units. And then if I take those 40 units and decide, um, okay, if I average this price point, it's going to lead to this volume, right? Mm -hmm. Because then I have a volume goal based on historic Um, you know, aspects, and then where I want to go. So if next year, again, if I'm doing 40 units, and let's just say roundabout, I want to do 20 million next year, right? 
then I'm taking those 40 units, divide that into the 20 million, and then you'll get your average price point. And right. so I think that that's, you know, that's a goal I have every year is to up that price point just a little bit. You had well, mentioned okay. that you're doing about a million in terms of average price point. I'm about 800,000 awesome. uh, this year, which, which I love. I love that little, little. Cause story. it sells. Yes. Because <laughs> it sells. It's important. So, yeah. And that is an important distinction that we'll get into. So I wanted to ask you that first, because I think agents need to know, like, how do I get to that price point, right? It's not pie in the sky. It's based off of hard evidence of where you've been and where you want to go. And so, yeah. So number two, um, you know, how do you gain, how would you say that you gain most of your business now? Do you do the same things marketing wise today that you've always done? Or do you market yourself differently now that you've been in the business for a while? Yeah, um, those are some great questions. So um, first of all, what I, I want to distinguish is that not everyone on this call is going to want to be in the luxury market or able to work in the luxury market, right? Um, I, I And that's, I don't think what the purpose of this conversation is. It's just to, how do you get yourself up? I mean, even if your average sale price is up $100,000, that changes the equation in terms of what you're going to make every year. And that's really, um, you know, very important. I, how I market my listings and my business is very much changed from when I started, um, uh, you know, selling houses. So I, I got in the business about 10 years ago and I remember um, getting my first listing and, you know, talking to my broker and saying, okay, I got a listing. And it was like a $750,000 listing. And my focus was always, you know, I, when I started interviewing, I was like, well, I'm going to work in the luxury market. And some of the brokers that I met with were like, oh yeah, sure. And, and our broker was like, great, Rebecca, that's fantastic. I can't wait to see it. And hence the reason I'm at Berkshire Hathaway. But, um, you, you know, I remember this listing and saying, okay, now what do I do? I've got this listing. You know, I'm a marketer. That's my background. But what is what did it mean to market a house? And, you know, I remember somebody saying, oh, well, put it on the MLS. And my response as a marketer was, that's not marketing. That's data entry. And that's the critical, important thing there is when you get a listing, if all you're doing is putting it into the MLS, that's not value added. And certainly when I first got into the business, I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't, you know, I would do as much as I could um, to promote our listings and my, my brand. Um, but it was a, a very small space I was trying to fill. Now, the type of marketing we do is, I mean, it, it's a ton in terms of, you know, uh, outreach in terms of our brand, outreach in terms of our listings, trying to get buyers, all those things. So it's very different now than it was. Do you feel like you focus more on, say, marketing pieces or do you focus more on networking? Because in your sphere, in in the luxury market, a lot of it is word of mouth, right? Like a lot of people know you in that arena. And so therefore, it's it's more the networking, who you know, word of mouth, whereas someone that may be looking to up their price point from, say, 400 to 600,000, it's more about hardcore marketing pieces. It's about, um, you know, being relevant, saturating the market in your community. So um, do you focus more on the networking side at this point in your career? Nope. I focus on both because here's where, you know, I used to tell people like I would advertise on Zillow and, or, you know, I would, I would be a preferred agent or whatever that is. And they would say, well, why would you do that? And you're just getting these calls. It wasn't for the leads. It was so that when a prospective buyer or seller that might be in my sphere went on to Zillow, they would see Rebecca Francis and go, oh, realtor. Oh, realtor, she's in my area. It's brand awareness. And that's why I advertise. It's all for brand awareness. It's not necessary to sell those homes. It, it's so that somebody is thinking about Rebecca Francis and the Rebecca Francis team when they go to buy or sell. That gives me legitimacy. And so then when I walk into a room, when I'm networking or I'm just going out for a drink or dinner, people will be like, 
oh, wait, I just saw her in Lehigh Valley style. And, oh, I saw them. Oh, there's a, they have ads at the, at the hospital in the cafeteria. Oh, yeah, 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 I know them. I think I'm going to list with them. That, so it's not just one, it's both. You know, everybody loves a winner, right? And if the perception is that you're the realtor to go to in that community. So I always look at it this way. There's always the brand awareness side of marketing, and then there's the actual marketing that will get you leads. Both are incredibly important. So um, would you say that where you position yourself, like you had mentioned some of these places that you know, you're you're putting your team name out there. Yep. Um, when it comes to price point in particular, you have to go to where those people are. Yeah. And so a lot of times when we market as agents, agents do this like scatter shot shotgun approach to marketing. Do you have a, a, a focus like you, you hone in on those places where your clientele are going to be in order to perpetuate yourself in that luxury market? Is Is that fair to say? Absolutely. I get calls every other day from someone asking me to advertise because they'll see me in a different publication and they'll say, well, she'll spend that on Lehigh Valley style. So maybe she'll spend this on that. And so I'm very particular. I have an advertising plan that I work on um, at the end of the year. So I've already started locking in my um, advertising venues for next year already. And so um, I know what I'm going to spend on a monthly basis. I know where we're going to be shown on a monthly basis. Um, And, um, you know, but that's as you grow, right? When you're not doing a ton of business, you have to be, well, when you are doing a ton of business, but even when you're not, you need to be very specific with your money, right? We don't have unlimited budgets. And even mine, it, it, it helps once you have a budget in place and you've got an advertising schedule in place because you get the phone call in May and they say, hey, would you advertise? Sorry, you know, my budget's, you know, spoken for for the year. Give me a call in October. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, it is very important. So when it comes to your marketing, do you do you make a drastic turn one way or another during the year or or do you do you stick to some core principles of your marketing and then maybe try one or two new things a year? Like do you do you switch things up, uh, you know, with major upheaval or do you kind of stick to the same things and add a couple new things in year to year? Yeah, I would say um Thus far, it's been an addition sort of thing. Um, and of course, as you you sell more homes, you make more money and a bigger percentage goes towards advertising and marketing, right? I'm at a point now where, interestingly, I have a marketing coordinator on staff and we were having a conversation the other day about one of the, our advertising pieces that we do on a monthly basis. And it, it's a nice chunk of change as it goes along. And I think it's a great branding um, avenue that we're, we're using. But my conversation with the marketing coordinator was that we need to go out and really see this. And I want to see if anybody's looking at that. And um, because I'm not hearing anything about it. I do think it's a great branding, but is it the best use of my money? I don't know. So absolutely we look at it and but you have to stick with something you know i give everything at a minimum 6 months a minimum 6 months most things you know you're in for a year in my opinion don't even bother to advertise if it's a one off even though that's what i did when i started in the business but okay i'm going to run one ad in this publication for like do you think that's really going to do anything it's probably not yeah, I, I almost look at it like if if you um, if you want to increase, I, I always look at this from a health standpoint. Say you take supplements, right? If you take one supplement one time, that's not going to do anything for you, right? You you have to it's the accumulation of everything over time that really becomes a tipping point. And Correct. so, like you said, like if you're going to commit to something, you have to commit. For at least, like you said, six months. I typically do it for a year. Yep. Give it a really good trial run to see how it's panning out. I want to ask you, we, we've been talking about the luxury market, but let's just say that an agent is trying to up their price point from 250000 a year to 500000 a year. 
if you were in that agent's shoes, what would you be doing to make that happen this year? Yeah, that's um, a great question. So, I, and I think to go along with that is there are a lot of people that aren't marketers, right? They don't know what to do or what not to do. And so <clears throat> if you're with Berkshire Hathaway, I think it's really important to utilize what we have available to you. There are incredible resources that we have through um, our ACE program um, and, you know, the uh, Berkshire Hathaway marketing um, program, all of those kinds of things. So utilize what is already available to you and you don't have to pay for it. Right. So that's number one. But number two is if you're trying to increase your average price point, you need to, first of all, say, OK, what is the, the amount? Who, what, what's the number that I'm going for? OK, great. Now, where are those homes? First of all, like, OK, where are all those neighborhoods? I know every neighborhood in this area that ha has houses a million, two million dollars. I know it like the back of my hand. right? Like I just do. But that's my market. And so if your average price point is five hundred thousand, that's what you're looking for. Then you need to figure out where are those houses? Once you know where those houses are, then you say, OK, who are these people that live in these houses? Um, what do they like? What do they read? What do they eat? Where do they shop? Um, all those kinds of things. And then you say, okay, well, how do I reach those people? And, you know, another thing is what clubs do they go to? Do they belong to golf clubs or tennis clubs? Or are they on the PTA? All those kinds of things. Like I was, um, you know, my children are, you know, senior in high school and, and a junior in college now, but school, that was an incredible resource for me is, you know, knowing people at school and getting involved in those things. So you want to be involved in things that you like, but um, also things where your, your people are coming from, your, your potential opportunities. So you've got to be there. But again, it takes you back to, you know, in simple terms, who is your target market and what do they like and how am I going to reach those people in my target market? You know, I think you bring up an excellent point because I think we're all striving for a niche in real estate. Like having a great niche is, is a cash cow. It's, yes. the gift that, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And if you can identify that niche, if you can pare real estate down into, okay, this is, this is where I want to be. Yeah. I think that's 90% of the battle because then you can formulate a plan yes. to reach those people. So before I got into management, when, when I was still in sales, I was going to do this thing where I was going to focus on just golf course communities, you know, within Montgomery County and just blanket market the entire place with like, you know, golf tees and, and, you know, mm -hmm. golf balls and like, you know, I sure. had this whole marketing thing figured out. Now I didn't end up doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was a strategy, right? And that that was something that would have upped my price point at that time. But you also bring out a, a great point that um, if your focus is those five hundred thousand dollars homes, you have to know every single house in your market that has those neighborhoods in order to reach those people. So the first thing is having market knowledge yes. and then focusing on, like you said, where those people are going to be. Where do they hang out? What do they do? What's the best way to reach them? You know, and, and I thought about like out of the box traditional marketing or or the opposite of traditional marketing in order to reach those people. Do you feel like you as as someone who's been in marketing, do you feel like um, or do you do anything to reach your clientele? outside of the traditional ways of marketing do you do some like guerrilla marketing like rebecca francis like okay. i always thought about like leaving my business cards in like a cereal box or something <laughs> and, and like okay. go go to whole foods and like like somehow like sneak my cards into like a loaf of bread or something <laughs> like that yeah Oh my gosh. I, you know, when I, I used to have an advertising and marketing firm and I had the gorilla guide to marketing. So that really takes me back. I think that was the nineties. Um, so that's, that was a good time, but no, I don't do any of that. <laughs> I do all of those tried and true things, you know, when kind of going back to when you, you know, where you're, where you want to go and trying to be where those people are. And I think that's really important. Like, 
I golf. I'm on a um, I, I'm on a golf league. Honestly, I really don't like golfing. I, I'm like, it's fine. But I know I get a lot of business from there. And, you know, so I go and I do my thing and I really like them in for the lunch. But, you know, that's it, it's you have to be where your clients are or your you know prospects are. And that it, it's it's pretty basic, like it's not rocket science. <laughs> you have to be in front of them. And, you know, another thing is sometimes you hear this, in my opinion, crazy stuff about you don't have to, you know, if you want, you could work the luxury market. It doesn't matter if you're driving a Pinto or whatever that is. It's fine. No, you got to look the part. And so, you know, you don't have to go if you're a $300,000 um agent now it's like to go to a million dollar like you have when you're working in the luxury market you have to provide so much value and there's there are so many costs involved right and and i i'll talk to people who say an agent be like oh i got you know a million dollar listing i'm like oh great what are you doing and they're like oh i put in the mls and i'm like oh wow and um you know like what else are you doing and if there's not a really good answer to that, they're going to get one. They're never going to get a second. And so, you know, what you you have to you have to put money into this. You have to even, you know, you have to dress the part in my opinion. And that, now remember, now I'm in my 50s. So, it could be a little bit like 20 year, you know, you hear things like 20 year olds, oh, much more casual or whatever. Okay, fine. But a lot of my clients are in their 50s, their 60s, their 40s, their 70s. They want me to come across and be dressed. I, they want to see me dress the part. Um, and that includes where I shop, what I wear, where I, you know, the clubs I go to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's really important. I know I've had some luxury listings where I've literally had clients tell me it's because I looked at your car. I looked at, you know, the way that you're dressed and I just felt like you were put together and, and you're, they think you're successful. Yes. And they think exactly. you're successful. So you like, you know, fake it, fake it till you make it, you know, I, I, <laughs> you make it exactly. Borrow it a car, rent a car. I don't yeah. care. And if that's what you want, you know, if that's the price point that you want, then you have to do what it takes to right. get you there. And part of that is also investing in yourself in terms of your marketing. Like you would mention, like, it's not a cheap thing when you're going to be marketing to, to that sphere, to that upper echelon clientele. It's, it's not the easiest thing in the world in terms of costs. You have to be prepared to spend money, right. you spend money to make money. Right. So absolutely. Uh, and the expectations are high. Yes. And the expectations are high. So I want to touch upon more about that because you know, time can be an important factor in increasing your price point. For example, first time home buyers that you've worked with in the past become move up buyers, right? Clients get better jobs. They start making more money over time. People yeah. have families. They need bigger houses. Um, you know, the one that you sold them five years ago isn't cut, cutting it anymore. They're going to look for something bigger. Do you think it's inevitable that an agent's price point should increase over time? Or do you disagree with that premise? Oh, wow. What a question. Um, I don't think it's inevitable <laughs> because, I mean, you know, so what? Your kid doesn't, I mean, you sell this one, their house, maybe they won't make more money. I don't know. They have five kids and, they, you know, they're sending them to school. So, no, it's not inevitable. It has to be very thoughtful. And I always look at my business and as this is my business. And how am I going to get to where I want to go? And, and you know, I show up every day, I, every day. And, I, you know, I work this. And from, from day one, when I was a new agent, I would show up at our office. And I might be the only person there besides the OA. And, um, and our, our broker would come in and, oh, hi, Rebecca. And I'd be upstairs all by myself. And, you know, I'd be sitting there going, good God, what do I do today? But I just showed up and I kept listening and learning and just trying to do better. Um, but also, I really had a focus on on who I was going after. So, yeah, I think, well, that's rule number one, right? Show up. And I feel oh, wow. like the, the agents that that it's the 80-20 rule. And we always yep. talk 
talked about it, you know, 20% of the agents are going to do 80% of the business. And those 20% of agents are the ones that are the core people that show up in the office all the time, the professionals in our industry. We talk about raising your price point as always being a good thing so far. Um, But is there a downside to having your price point being too high? Absolutely. First of all, it takes a lot longer to sell. And, uh, you know, and there's a lot of holding costs there, right? As from a time, energy, you know, money perspective, if you're if you hold on to a listing for six months to a year, I'm marketing a listing for six months to a year. That's a lot that can get to be a lot on um, the expectations from your clients are very high. Um, and they want to know, I mean, they want FaceTime. They want um, they want to know that you're thinking about their listing all the time. I was working on some market reports this morning and, and truthfully think about the last couple of years, we haven't had to, very few people have had listings that sat, right? Guess what folks, we're going back to it. There's going to be more houses on the market. You know, I have a newer agent and she was like, Oh, I don't know. You know, a house been on the market for two weeks. What do I do? And I'm like, what? (laughs) But has never lived in the world of, you know, oh, six months. Of course, it's not sold yet, you know. And and so that's going to be a real uh, rude awakening for newer agents, I think. Um, so I don't know. I don't even remember what the question was. Uh, but. No, no. I think I, I agree with you. I, I think that, you know, early in my career, I had a, a luxury agent that I greatly respect in my office say, that if she could reinvent herself and do it over again, she would focus on the price point between four hundred to eight hundred thousand. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's what sells. It sells. And it sells. we've been we've been kind of pampered the past, mm-hmm. you know, yes. three four years in the luxury market because, yes. uh, you know, just like everything else, it's been a strong market for everybody, right? Including exactly. luxury sales. But yes. those luxury sales, like you, you say, you know, the stress that comes along with not having a luxury property sell and the oh. carrying costs and all that stuff yeah. for a year, and then you lose the listing, and then oh. somebody else reduces the price and they sell it right away. Sell it right I away. mean, yeah, that's brutal. So, it's brutal. yeah, so I, you know, to everybody listening out there, it's always nice to have the prestige of having a beautiful luxury listing, but. Um, do you want that in the end? Yeah. Because all that stuff is very real and it comes with it. So, you know, for my money, if I can average where I am right now, 800,000 for the rest of my career, I will be a very happy man. Happy man. Because, yep. You know, I know it's going to sell, um, you know, outside of some catastrophic effect. <laughs> I mean, the market could go south tomorrow for everybody, but I'm just saying that you're going to make a lot of money if you, if you average that. And I think the ultimate goal here is to save you time, save you effort, and you make just as much money as you would selling a $250,000 home that you would, you know, selling an an $800,000 home. Um, It's going to take that same effort, make some more money, you know, doing it. it. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And, you know, Jason, I just wanted to harken back to one, you know, one of your first questions about at, at every year, do I kind of come up with where I want to be? And, you know, as an example, maybe two years ago, I wanted to actually reduce my average price point because I needed things that were going to kind of fill in the gaps. And I started looking at like, OK, maybe I want that five, a couple of those five to seven hundred thousand dollars. And not a couple, I wanted a lot of them. And because I needed to fill in the gaps between selling the bigger, the bigger homes. And, you know, I, the next year we did, we did a lot of that kind of business. And then of course, at the end of that year, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want more of the million dollar homes. But, um, you know, I, I also want to say though, one, people always say, oh, well, you know, it's just, um, if you increase your average price point, you're you're making more money for the same thing. Let's be clear. It's not the same thing. I don't do the same thing I do for a $300,000 house that I would do for a million dollar house. And it's easier for me to sell a $300,000 house than it is for me to sell a million dollar house. But I'd rather personally focus on one than having to focus on three to make up for that you know, a commission. Uh, that's a great point. You're absolutely positively 
correct that it, it's not the same. My my point, you know, my point is like you had said, like instead of having to sell five of this price point, you mm-hmm. can just sell one of this price point. And yes, it's going to take more effort, but overall, you're saving that that time by right. having to do five different transactions. Now you can do one transaction to take its place. Right. Um, I learned long ago. I had a really good year one year. Um, and at least, you know, early in my career. And I, I think I had done like 20 units and I was kind of a relatively new agent and I was very happy with that. But my price point was atrocious. It, it, I mean, I'm not even going to say what it was because, you know, agents average different price points out there. But for me, yeah, I was, was like, perfect. I really have to get better with my price point because I am busting my butt. And I am not making the money that I want to make. If I could just double my price point right. and and potentially double my income, like yeah. look how much more money I could be making right now by doing, you know, basically running around like a chicken with my head cut right. off, you know? Right. And so that's when I really kind of the light bulb went off and, and said, I really have to start making a concerted effort to to up my price point each year. And from yes. that point forward with my business plan, that's always kind of worked out for me. Now, I don't yeah. know if that's like manifesting things, you know, because I again, believe that. Yeah, a lot of it is like your mindset, right? And if you I focus am. on that price point, it, somehow magically it ends up happening for you. So, um there's a lot of effort that goes into that behind that. Yeah. But I'm sure. saying that if you have those numbers in your head, you will succeed. So have have a plan to start. Have a plan, absolutely. All right. Before we get out of here, I want to ask you one last thing. So since you know, since in that luxury sphere, um, now I've never asked you this. I don't know if you (laughs) brokers opens or anything Uh like that. What is the bougiest thing you've ever done when hosting a brokers open? Oh Lord. (laughs) <laughs> have, you, have you done something like crazy marketing wise to like, you know, get a listing sold? Uh, I'm going to give you a, an example. Okay. okay. I went to a, an, a broker's open one time and I went with my now wife at the time we were dating and uh, there they brought in a Ferrari dealer um, from, from, uh, from the main line to, to have Ferraris out front in this broker's open and they had a salesman that was selling Ferraris. That's awesome. So of course this salesman thinking that somehow I had the money to buy a Ferrari starts talking to me. My wife went into the house. She had no, she had absolutely no interest. And so before you know it, I'm sitting in the Ferrari, like playing with the paddle shifters and (laughs) I love it. This, this person's trying to sell me a Ferrari out front. And my wife calls me and she's like, what are you doing? Get it out. <laughs> like, don't like stop wasting their time. You know? Yeah. So I, I said, you know, basically like, all right, I'm coming. And I, I went back in. But is there anything marketing wise that you have done to promote a listing that's been kind of of that, uh, you know, that ilk? I have to admit, no. Um, but, you know, the one uh, uh, one funny kind of car story was I had a client we were selling is, I don't know, a $1.3 million house. And um, he, he we were about to put it on the market. And he said, Rebecca, I have an idea that I want to put in front of you. I said, what's that? And he said, I was thinking, so I've got a Porsche and I'm ready to trade in the Porsche. It's not that old, but, you know, it's just like I've got kids, whatever. So I'm ready to get, get rid of the Porsche why don't we throw the portion with the sale of the house? And he said, we'll, we'll raise the price of the house by a hundred thousand. We'll throw in the Porsche, call it a day. And I was like, um, hmm. I'm like, have you been watching too much of like Ryan Seacrest or something? <laughs> Whoever that guy is, Ryan. What's his name? Yeah. Sir. So you had Sir Han. Did, uh... Sir Han. Sir Han. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know. This is kind of the Lehigh Valley. We, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a little too bougie. I think the main line's a little more bougie. We're a little more understated here in the Lehigh Valley. <laughs> well, I, I will tell you that that might pose a problem for a lender as well. If you're throwing in a Porsche. True. I, so, that, we we yeah. pulled back. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's going to fly. <laughs> yeah. Spe- speaking, of, speaking of which, I have, I, I thought it was so clever one time. I wrote an agreement and I said I was going to, to give a case of wine, like a really nice wine yeah. to the seller. Uh-huh. And uh, and we got the we got the house, and immediately awesome. the lender was like, "Take 
take that case away. Don't lie, right? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? That's value, you know? Yeah, right. oh, so that's... always be careful not to write in a Porsche to your agreement of sale or right, exactly. fine wine. <laughs> Put that on an addendum. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah, sneak that into an addendum on the side. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Anyway, well, Rebecca, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I always feel like when we're together, I feel like I can talk to you all day. So <laughs> uh, it's great. It's great to have you back on. A much continued success to you in the Lehigh Valley. Uh, And I'm sure that we're going to be talking before long. Uh, I'll probably see you somewhere at some point along the line. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. That was the conversation with Rebecca Francis. It's always good to talk to Rebecca. Here are a few takeaways from our time together. Number one, if you're looking to up your price point, When you write your business plan, and all of you should be writing a business plan every year, but when you write your business plan, you want to make sure that you're using factual evidence to be able to formulate a price. So again, as I mentioned before, if your goal is to do, say, 20 units this year, and last year you did a certain amount of volume, let's just say you did $5 million in volume, and this year you think that the market is going to be stronger, so you want to up that volume goal to seven point. Five million. You're going to take those 20 units and divide that into seven and a half million, and you will then get your price point of what you want to shoot for. But make sure that you're trying to up that price point every year. I feel like real estate in many ways is just a game, right? We are competing against ourselves every year to, to maximize what we can do in terms of our business. So make sure to know what you're competing against in the past in order to make your business plan for the future. Number two, if you are looking to up your price point, the first thing that you need to know is who is my target market and where are they located? Because now you can formulate a game plan in order to reach those people. So you may need to think about a new way of marketing to reach those people and where they are. If you know that people in that target market, let's just say it's 600,000, and you know a few neighborhoods um, that are within that range, and maybe there's a gym nearby, maybe there's a YMCA or a Lifetime Fitness, and you find that a lot of those people that live in that area go to that gym. Well, then you may think about starting to market at that gym. If there's a grocery store or a coffee shop nearby that you know that those people frequent, then you need to think about trying to market within those spaces in order to gain those new clients that live in the neighborhoods that you're targeting. You need to reach those people where they are, so think about it strategically when you're putting your dollars and cents into marketing in order to up your price point. Last but not least, if your ultimate goal is to be a premier luxury agent with a very high price point, just know that there are some potential downsides to having your price point be too high. You have to decide where that sweet spot is for you and what's best for your business. If you have a fantastic niche that's given you a steady lead source in your business, by all means, cultivate that niche and continue to do what you're doing because that's going to lead to your ultimate success. Well, that's it for the podcast this week. We'll be back in another couple of weeks with a new topic, a new guest. And as always, if you want to hear something that we haven't covered yet, please reach out to me, jason.ostrowski at foxroach.com. And if you haven't liked and subscribed to the podcast or left us a review yet, please do so. It helps us to reach more people. Once again, this is Jason Ostrowski saying stay safe out there, stay selling, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the Everything Real Estate Podcast.